And then I, I, I know you're going to have something to say on this. So I'm not going to really frame it as a question. I'm just going to make a statement. And then I'd like for you to kind of uh, jump in wherever you feel comfortable. Um, I, I looked up uh, uh, a recent uh, or not so recent, maybe two, three years ago, news article where I read that Al Sharpton, no disrespect to Al Sharpton, but, but, but his name came up. They said that during the Obama presidency, Al Sharpton was invited to the White House about 84 times. And I said, it's kind of surprising to me that, that with all the economic problems that Black people have, that you would invite Al Sharpton to the White House 84 times, but not invite Dr. Claude Anderson once. Dr. Claude Anderson, if, if I'm not mistaken, at that time, you lived not too far from the White House. You lived right there in D.C. And it wouldn't have been, you know, nothing but a little short little Uber ride or a little drive over to, to the White House. And, and, and you're one of the, the most respected economic thinkers in history, not just in the country, not just now, but, but literally in the history of, of this country. And, and, and so, when, you know, my opinion is that when you're solving the problem, when you, when you claim to be solving a problem, but you're not talking to serious people, then you're not really serious about solving the problem. You uh -huh. know, it, 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 this is not anti Al Sharpton. It's not anti anybody. This is really, uh, you know, in a way I saw this as a, a situation where when you really don't want to do something, you'll find any excuse not to do it. It's like, like when uh, Alicia, my fiance tells me to go clean the kitchen and wash the dishes I'll find any excuse. I'll say, well, I would have, I would have uh, washed the dishes, but I could only find one sock and I need two socks to go oh, wash the dishes. So I, that's why I couldn't get it done, right? So so it almost seems to me that part of the role of the black elite, which is why the black elite, we have to watch out for the black elite, is that the black elite's job is, as you mentioned, to maintain the status quo. Their, their job is to do a whole lot of nothing, to but make you think that doing nothing is the same as doing something. Make you think right. they really did something when nothing gets done, nothing changes, nothing moves forward. I, I'm, I can't help but wonder if there's a history to that. You know, you're a history expert. Is there a history to the black elite being used to control the masses of black people so that we don't really actually ask for anything in exchange for our votes and our money? Yes, that, that is. That, uh, that was done with starting, I think, initially, initially, initially they, that, that started with a, uh, that started in about, I guess, about eight, about, 17, about late 1790s. When, I, when black folk were all enslaved, but a few blacks began to express an interest in learning, learning picking up some, acquiring some religious spiritualism in their own in their own communities and their own families, and that started. So few of them started going to church with white folks, riding to church with white folk, and uh, and, and the white folk then make them sit in a separate section in the church, used up in the balcony, and the, while the whites sit down on the main floor. That went on in, in from about eight about eight seventeen ninety seven up until about. About 1818. By 1818, the pressure began to mount on white folks to be able, because black folks said, We want to have our own ministers. We want to have our own ministers. And so at that point in time, they said, Okay, we let you have your own ministers, but we have to pick them. We got to pick the ministers. We've got to make sure these people are about as safe as 20 times safer than a, than a birth control pill. Can, I mean, <laughs> which means there's absolutely no way, there's no way, there's no way you could accidentally get pregnant on this. Uh, and so, but the whites said, we got, and therefore we have. <laughs> now, see, if you keep laughing, I can't get this point out. <laughs> I'm saying that, that, that was funny, but go, go, go ahead, go ahead. Because we don't, okay. want, we don't want black people to be pregnant with possibilities. Or That's pregnant, right. Pregnant with ideas now. Go, go, right. go ahead. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, then, so they started picking the minister. And they said, now, what we got to pick, we got to pick the, we got to pick, the, pick the, the, the dumbest black we can get our hands on. And in, and embed him with some some spiritualism called calisthenics, and uh, so what uh, what they did then they, they gave him uh, a sheet saying they learned black blacks he had to learn it said uh, who brought you into the world God did who told who made you a slave God did who who you working to, most for it uh, to on his farm godliness and so then where everything they blamed it so they gave credit to God he had these ministers to teach this thing and black folk became very humble and so your leadership then became First leadership started coming out of the, out of those churches that were that the, that the, that the, uh, that the uh, whites picked, chose, and led, and they said, and to, to the present time they still got whites still going to all the black churches during the, during the voting period to go in and buy the and buy the black vote, and they have the minister step in front of the congregation and says y'all got to do this y'all got to do that, 
And so that was the first black leadership. Then later on, it moved, to, it moved from, from the religion over to, uh, to, uh, to, to politics, civil, civil rights. And that came out after the Civil War. And, uh, and so the leadership began to come out of the civil rights movement. And, uh, uh, and, and, and coming out, the first time it broke was in, uh, in North Carolina when, uh, when a bunch of black folk went to St. Paul's Church down there and demanded that, that st stop teaching us about a pie in the sky after death. They started doing something for us, and so and 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 that so that out of that they raised so much cane at Slang Ball Church, and they said, okay, we're gonna we, we'll start quick picking the, picking the ministers. We'll start picking civil rights leaders. So they started picking civil rights leaders, and after that, later on, uh, as we got into the 1900s, after the Black Power movement, uh, they started picking the elected black elected officials to be your leaders, and uh, so black elected officials became the leaders. But then I found out in 1960 when I did a study that they accomplished absolutely nothing of consequence. That I looked at, I did a, I did a social discomfort indicator. You see, we had only 103 black elected officials in, 19, in 1960 at that time, began, when they moved from, from civil rights, I mean, uh, leader over to, to the black elected officials. And I said, I wanna see what they had accomplished. So I measured it in terms of social discomfort indicators like welfare, food stamps, criminality, no money, no businesses, nothing. And I did the same study in 1990 to see what had happened because by 1990, the number of black elected officials had gone up as leaders from about 103 all the way up to over 9,000, Dr. Watkins. And I said, with a 9,000% increase, then we should have black folks should be floating on cotton, okay? And so then I looked at them and looked at the discomfort indicators and guess what? Blacks didn't go forward with a 9,000% with a increase. They went backwards. And I found there was no there was no connection between putting a black person in office, whether appointed or elected, and black folk getting benefits. And so black leaders that went into office would always tell you right up front that if I get elected or I get appointed, I will not do anything for black folk. Now, where did that come from? That came out of the uh, the, the uh, centennial thing that came in 1870 after the Civil War and after and during Reconstruction, where whites said we're gonna let, we're gonna let y'all have a few jobs now after the Civil War in, in public service, either as postmen or, or, or janitors or working in a public office or as, as a policeman or a sheriff in your own little neighborhoods. And, but you want three things you cannot do. You cannot get into your public office and talk about black folk as a whole, as a race. You cannot talk about them like a race. You gotta stay with individualism. That way we keep your ass outnumbered by our, get one, your one to our millions. So you can't achieve anything that way. That was the first thing. You cannot talk about groupism. And two, you cannot talk about anything that's specifically black because they knew that blacks were exceptionals in this, in this society. Blacks have been treated like, and mistreated, maltreated like no other group in, this, in the history of this nation. And they say, you can't talk about what has happened to you in the past. And, uh, and thirdly, they say, you cannot, try to, you cannot try to hold white folks accountable for what they've done to you for 360 years in terms of reparations. And so as soon as a black person get appointed or, or elected to an office, the first thing he's gonna declare, just like right now, anybody runs, with, runs for a public office, the first thing they're gonna say, we're gonna get elected, we're gonna, we're gonna take care of everybody. That defeats the whole purpose of voting. Why in the world would you go vote and you're gonna take care of every damn body? You're supposed to take care of the people that put you in office. But, but Democrats, particularly, they use black folks as, as, as an absentee e when the benefits come and take them for granted when they're voting and nobody ever put in the benefits to them. They want black folk to always believe that they got an obligation to be like Christ-like, to, to hang themselves on a cross, to take care of everybody else, to carry the water for every group except their own group, stay away from taking care of their own people, but carry the water for everybody else. And, that, and, that, and that's one of the philosophies that white folks put on black folk. You gotta, be, you, gotta be, you gotta be beyond trying to help your own people. Don't you ever get caught helping your own people. And, that's, and, and, they, and they practice that right now. So you watch any person running for office, I don't care if it's running for a presidential seat or a vice presidential seat or running for any congressional office, Senate or Congress. They're always going to pretend that their responsibility is to take care of their own people. And that's what makes the difference. See, I used to tell black folk back in, in 1960 about when we started the Congressional Black Caucus that time up there, that you're supposed to be looking at the black folk in the Congress as a Congressional Black Caucus. And, uh, and guess what? In, in, in 47, 47, almost 50 years,